This is the Can Crushers Wrestling Podcast. The following contest is scheduled for one fall. Let's go nuts! It's Jimmy Nuts! Drive out of the car! With your host, Mark Martinez. Remember, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. And the English professor. It's called a garbage can, not a garbage cannot. Hey, this is former WWE superstar Duke, the Dumpster Drossy, and you are listening to the Can Crushers Podcast. B. C. Steel. That's enough that you should be excited for this episode of Can Crusher Spotlight. B. C. Steel. Women, that should really get you excited. B. C. Steel is going to be on Can Crusher Spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Can Crusher Spotlight. I am your host, Mark Martinez. I have one of Jack Pollock's Bud Light Seltzers ready to drink, ready to get into this interview with B. C. Steel. He did it before Eli Drake. B. C. Steel. Guys, right around the corner after you listen to Al Snow tell you all about Collar and Elbow, B. C. Steel will be here. Don't forget when you check out at collarandelbow.com with your hats, hoodies, tees, all the comfortable, awesome looking designs of wrestling apparel, use Can Crushers. All one word. Capital C in can, capital C in crushers, and you will get 10% off. Coming up next, B C Steel. Yes, I was pointing. Wrestling. A love and a passion we all share. I've started a wrestling brand. The wrestling brand. A brand founded on the aspects of wrestling. Two entities working together to create a product that connect emotionally for people everywhere. Collar and Elbow is the brand. Passion and love for wrestling is the drive. I am Al Snow, and this is Collar and Elbow, the wrestling brand. This is the B to the C to the S to the T to the double E L E Benjamin C. Steele. Mr. Steele of here. Nasty. Ladies, remember, none of you can be first, but a whole bunch of you can be next. You're listening to the Can Crushers Wrestling Podcast, and if you're not, you are the worst part of society. If you are, share it with a friend Because as good as it is that you're listening, it's even better if more people listen. So do it. And welcome back to Can Crushers. Man, I'm excited. I am so excited to have probably the greatest manager active right now around anywhere on the show today because he... He probably won't remember anything that he talks about anyway because he's been crushed in the head so much. That's your introduction. Welcome to the show, BC Steel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, You're welcome for uh, being had. And, uh, yeah, hopefully no shots to the head during this as I uh, am around my uh, very wonderful estate in my office. So uh, there shouldn't be anything attacking me, but no guarantees. Right. Um, before we get into wrestling... Really, really, how's everything around your estate in, uh, you know, this whole COVID is still pretty crazy, especially around your neck of the woods. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, I've been telling people just personally that uh, if you grew up an only child, being at home during COVID-19 is not a real big deal. (laughs) And I was an only child, so uh, there was never really... Any time where I was bored, I could always find something to entertain myself. And thank God this is 2020 with DVDs and Blu-ray and Netflix and Hulu and video games and uh, <clears throat> adult uh, websites uh, that, that may or may not be partaken in from time to time. So there's, there's always stuff to uh, keep, 
keep educated and keep entertained. And finding myself, as scary as it seems, actually working out more. This is not going to result in me launching my wrestling career at 36, but at least it uh, should keep me alive for a couple more years anyway. So you're not going to be DDP? Uh, there will be no uh, diamond cutter. Uh, no one will feel the bang. I will not uh, be taking on uh, the NWO. There will be no semblance of DDP, and we will not have BCS yoga coming out anytime soon either. Well, I hope somebody feels the bang at least some point. Maybe somebody to borrow when they open back up or something like that, right? Oh well, well, there there will be people. People, wow! There will be uh, bang being felt. I'm gonna I'm gonna get myself in trouble, or maybe I will get hit uh, if my better half hears this. But there there will be a, a bang going on. I will make sure I tag her. I will make sure. I tag her. It, it will result in what is this? But to be honest, she has chores to do, so I wouldn't let her go online anyway. Oh well, then yeah, get to work. No, that's that's. I probably shouldn't have said that. No, uh, yeah. Um, so tell me, besides working out, what uh, what else can you brag about since the COVID hit? I mean, you you've not been doing anything but watching porn and playing video games. What's something that you could say? Hey, I've at least done this besides working out. Because you have to throw that out. Uh, well, I have attempted to educate my fellow man. Again, this is this is more personal, but uh, and this is going to deviate wildly from wrestling. But uh, just with everything going on, I think there's a real belief that people need to learn personal finance and learn, you know, for their financial future. And I'm not going to, you know, plug a program. I don't have one, but kind of putting stuff together and, and teaching people, hey, this is how you invest. This is how you set aside money. This is how you train yourself to be fiscally responsible. And there's a wealth of, of information all over the Internet. But trying to take that that's a passion of mine and project that to people and friends and, and people close to me and just say, hey, you know, this is definitely the time because this could very well, we could all be in this situation again six months from now where we see stuff shutting down and we see people kind of like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to, you know, live off of this for a while. And especially those that may have unstable income like those in indie wrestling, like those uh, maybe that, that rely on sales where you need to be face-to-face. -face. So, Granted, very, very different, but uh, constantly educating others and myself just kind of on the finances and going on. And to humble brag, I can say that I actually have made money in the last month. We won't talk about the first two months. I don't count those, but in the last month anyway, I've actually made money uh, during a pandemic. So so that's good. I'm, I'm ready to uh, invest in my own wrestling company now. Kidding. Uh, Please. God, uh, no. Uh, um. So you're telling me on paper you're non-essential except what you're doing, right? Uh, essentially, yes. Uh, I mean, I personally am essential, but oh, but, yeah. but perhaps uh, otherwise, yes, we could say non-essential. Oh, well, if you ever want to be a garbage man with me, make the trek up here and I will give you a day because son of a bitches are eating so much at home. I'm telling you, when this, when people are allowed out of their house, they're going to have to do DDP yoga or, you know, BC Steel yoga to get out because it's unbelievable what's going on during this pandemic. We will be launching uh, perhaps a BCS yoga uh, then in uh, early 2021, I might now be motivated to uh, put that out there. See, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I'll give you a 5% kickback. That's, well, that's 5% more than my wife gives me, so I'm good. Well, there you go. On anything. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Right. All right, let's get into wrestling, and then uh, we'll see where this train wreck goes from here. Uh, let's rewind all the way back to the beginning how did you find this crazy business that we both love? Well, if you to go back in my life, you have to go all the way back to 1987. Uh, I was four years old, and for those that can uh, do the math, that means I was born in 83. So I am 36, soon to be 37. My earliest memory of childhood, of everything, really, I was sitting on the couch with my father. He's flipping through, and I saw some guy come off the top rope something like that, didn't think anything of it. It was like, okay, that was interesting. Flips through, goes through again. For those that are younger, we only had like 40 channels. I know that blows people's minds because now there's like 2,000 and, and related to just about anything you can think of. But 
flipping through, going through, he comes across wrestling again, and I asked my father, I said, what is that? And he goes, oh, that's that wrestling stuff. And somebody was in a shiny blue outfit. Don't remember who it was. It could have been Blue Blazer, Coco Beware. There were a couple other guys that had blue during those days. But I noticed it, and I said, well, wait, I want to watch that. So I watched it, and I was instantly hooked. Then it was every Monday, uh, or Monday or Tuesday back then, it was, I need to watch this. Like, it's 9 o'clock, I'm going to watch this, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to stay up for it. I'm going to fall asleep, but I'm going to watch what I can. And then it was, hey, here's a show Saturday, here's a show Sunday, here's, I found WCW in the late 80s, early 90s. Well, I think it was still NWA affiliate WCW at that point. But uh, then in the late 90s, there was a three-hour block on Saturday nights. It was 11 o'clock was ECW to 12, 12 to 1 was Shotgun Saturday night, and then 1 to one thirty or 2 was Local Pro Wrestling Express. So I had found local wrestling i was like wow this is like a this is a thing that isn't you know some far away thing that i can't fathom it's right down the street so to speak uh from there steel city wrestling ran by norm connors who later ran iwc had run 10 minutes from my house and i had gone to shows with a few of my friends up to like five people we would just sit and be annoying probably <laughs> in retrospect but i mean 15 12 to 16 years old what else were we going to do and we would go to shows and then through that uh, norm connor's got me information because i signed up for the mailing list because i wanted front row seats that was my big thing i started going with him to shows and he would kind of give me advice teach me because i would ask a million and one questions and if i had your screen name back in the late 90s yeah screen name for people that aren't aware of the aim and aol days wow uh, yeah this, this, it, i date myself a lot but it's all right if i had your screen name i was going to ask you a million and one questions i mean everything under the sun that you could think of i was going to pester you and thank god i had people that would teach me and give me advice and anytime Anybody came in from anywhere. If you were on a show, I was probably going to hound you down and ask you some sort of question, whether you were, you know, fresh out of training school or a 20-year vet. I just I needed to know about wrestling. I needed to know everything that I could think of under the sun, and I needed my answer right away. Sometimes I was a little impatient. But through that and finding local wrestling, I met uh, Bobby Williams, Robert Parker Williams, uh, whatever of a thousand names you he's gone by over the years. Uh, who's my best friend, and just him and I started going to shows, and then he had done the website for the late great Double Budokan, and then he started training, and then I started training, and we trained at another, uh, the late Joe Perry in oh, training wow. school. Yeah, so we were there in 2001, and then, you know, from there, uh, somebody needed a ref on a show and I was like, eh, I don't feel comfortable. You know, I, I, I don't feel that I could do a capable enough job, it, but if you need a last minute replacement, there's nobody else you can find. I'll do it. And they couldn't find anybody. It ended up being me. And then just kind of took off from there. I, I don't know if I was a good ref. Well, I, I definitely wasn't a good ref when I started, <laughs> but I was there. I was a body. I was cheap. And some people, had known me from going to shows for three, four years previous, so that kind of helps me get my foot in the door to some places. So that is the synopsis of age four BC Steel to uh, age eighteen. Wow, that was Mark Steel at that point. Mark Steel version one. Uh, so you brought yes. up, you brought up a lot, and Steel City was one that would make its way up around our area. And one of my favorites was Beef Stew Lou. We had him on the show. Uh, who I, I can't even. Johnny Polo was there for a little bit. Raven, and it, it was just was Steel City one of your favorites then with Norm? Oh, absolutely. I, I still remember the first Steel City match I saw. It was a guy by the name of Jimmy V, who I've mentioned this to other guys who came from that Jersey area, and they vaguely remember him. Like he just stuck out because he was the first guy that I saw. And he came out, and he was a baby face, and it was kind of a hokey, like, cheer for me. And me and my friends just shit on him. Like, just absolute, I mean, now I'm like, man, I, I feel kind of bad because it, it did not go well for him. And his opponent was Don Montoya, who, yes. if people aren't familiar, a guy that in 97, 98 was 
300 pounds, 350 maybe, that could fly like a cruiserweight. And he was, uh, people know Reckless Youth and Mike Quackenbush, those three had kind of, they were the Punk and Cabana before Punk and Cabana. Those three would be in uh, three ways or tag teams or one-on-ones or, you know, any sort of concoction. A lot of times for Norm Connors was Steel City. So from that moment, uh, uh, Don Montoya became like my favorite wrestler. I had his T-shirt. I had his 8x10s. I embarrassingly, when I was 15, I didn't quite understand how things went. I had asked him, hey, uh, how do I become a manager? And he goes, hey, yeah, you need to uh, contact the state athletic commission and get your manager's license. Obviously, he's like, okay, this kid's a pain in the ass. Like, I'm going to just send him on this wild goose chase and nothing will happen. So, of course, I called the state, and they were very confused by that. So I told him, you know, hey, I called the state, and they said, uh, you you have to uh, talk to the promoter, but but you didn't tell me that. He goes, oh, uh, yeah, talk to the promoter. So I talked to Norm, and he's like, okay, uh, just sit down. Like, I'm going to tell you exactly how things are and why you need to, to just settle down. So uh, it's a thing now when I hear somebody say, hey, I think I'd be a good manager. And I'm like, oh, well, do you want to train? Well, I think I'd be a good manager. Part of me is like, okay, it's not – because you're funny at parties doesn't mean you can be a manager, but I also think of me as a 15-year-old kid that thought, hey, I like wrestling. I want to do this. I'm going to just, you know, do this. So uh, a lot of parallels. But to, to really answer your question that you asked before I started giving you my uh, life story, the Steel City was, was my thing. I mean, me and my friends would go to Steel City Wrestling. I had friends in my high school that – would go to shows on and off, and they kind of saw me as the wrestling kid, like, hey, what's going to be on this show? What's going to be on that show? Is so-and-so going to be there? And I would have a Rolodex in my brain of another dated reference is a Rolodex. But I would have, yeah, this match is going to happen, and last show, this guy did this, and this guy did that. But So I think this show, this is going to happen, and I could give you the full rundown of, of what the show was and when the shows were and, and all of that. And some of the stuff weirdly still sticks out. So that's kind of cool, but other stuff, it's just a hodgepodge and mismatch of of stuff. So, uh, yeah, Steel City Wrestling was, was definitely my favorite back in the day, but I tried to watch everything. And there was a lot of local wrestling on TV in the late 90s. So, But Steel City Wrestling was definitely tops. So you and I are clearly on the same path. You, you win the business, me doing this for the business, whatever. Um, together we would have ruled the world because uh, I can't tell you who the 12th president of the United States was, but I did polls in elementary school. Who was better, the Rock and Roll Express or the Midnight Rockers? Or who did you like better, the Powers Band? And I'm asking kids all over the the freaking schoolyard. Hey, who, they don't know what the hell. They're just telling me answers just to get me the hell out of their way. <laughs> yeah, I'm that jackass as well. And I mean it out of love to you. You're that jackass as well at that age. No, oh, I absolutely was. I mean, there, there's people, veterans that had left the business in like early 2000s that haven't seen me progress. And I think in some senses might still think of me as that 15-year-old kid that would – Hey, do you remember when you did this? I'm like, yeah, I, I, I remember that. And I had a nickname, which was a really weird nickname. And they would say, do people still call you that? I'm like, no, nobody knows that. So we're going to move on from that, and uh, we're not going to bring that up. They're like, nobody knows you? I'm like, no, they don't. They know me as BC Steel, not the weird nickname that I used to introduce myself as that would get strange looks. So it is a uh, it, it was rough early on trying to break the mold of uh, the clueless 15-year-old kid. And now I'm the clueless 36-year-old man. Hey, 43, and I'm still clueless. <laughs> so I've got seven years, and there's going to be no hope is what you're telling me. <laughs> no hope whatsoever. Uh, it, um, yeah, screwed. you're screwed. Uh, you've mentioned Coco Beware and Owen Hart because you saw them because blue is your favorite color. But who are some of your favorites uh, in childhood that, that you really went to? Was, was Coco one of them? Uh I always liked guys that could keep my attention for whatever reason. I actually liked Hulk Hogan until I wrote him a letter, and he sent me a postcard back. It was when Earthquake squashed him. I don't think I've ever told this story. I just found the letter the other day. I stole a postcard that he sent back. And, you know, it was write Hulk Hogan a letter at this address, and you'll get a return response. So six-, seven-year-old me was like, this is amazing. I knew what wrestling was from a young age because my father – and mother would tell me, hey, you know, they're athletes, you're you, not using a <laughs> you're you, do not jump off the couch onto your stuffed animals, you will hurt yourself, 
this is kind of how it is. Think of it this way. Enjoy it, but just, you know, be smart. And But still, I wrote that letter, and he sent me back a response that didn't address me in any way. It just said, Dear Hulkamaniac, I could tell it wasn't his signature. And from that moment on, I just I was done with Hulk Hogan. Absolutely, completely done. The guys that I would really attach myself to were guys that could do interviews, like Jake Roberts, uh, Roddy Piper, which uh, I have met him one time. I only met him for 10 minutes, and I'm sure he had forgotten me the second after he met me because he's probably met 300 people that day. But I just said, you know, you're a guy that I was always watching the TV when you were on, and I just I couldn't understand why. I said, like, what makes you promo-wise especially, because that's kind of where I, I – like to uh, focus on I said as somebody that cuts a lot of promos what did you do that would make you gather people or garner people's attention and get them to stay and he said something which changed the way I've done interviews since that day was I believed everything I said I never said something unless I had a belief in it because if you believe it it's easier to project and you'll continue on and even now when I watch guys whether it's matches or interviews I can tell if somebody believes what they're doing or if they're focusing on playing the role that they think they should be playing. So guys like that, Jake Roberts, weirdly enough, I wasn't a huge fan, but Warrior would keep my attention. Uh, another one was Arn Anderson. Yeah. Because he would speak, you know, Flair would rant and rave, and, and you would have Sting would woo and scream and all this, and you would have Hogan, and, it, and Arn Anderson would just very flat out tell you and bring that voice down much like a Jake Roberts this is what's going to happen you're going to be the guy that gets beat I'm going to be the guy to do it to you and there's nothing you can do about it I'm like oh like okay he's he's the guy doing different so I need to pay attention to what he's saying and I think God Arn Anderson is probably one of my I would I don't know if you want to say hidden gems but unsung heroes of professional wrestling my top three guys that uh, top four guys, I'll say, that never change. Uh, like, my top ten will vary, but my top four are always the same in some order. Two Cold Scorpio, which is random, but the first time I saw him, I couldn't fathom what I was watching. And seeing a guy come from literally nowhere that had never been on TV, never really had uh, been seen by a mass public, and to get that reaction from the time he came out to, not crickets, but less of a reaction to the time he left and people were going insane, just stuck with me to this day. Uh, Brian Pillman, because I appreciated him more now than I did then. But at the time, he was also a guy doing stuff that I hadn't really seen with a flair that could, no pun intended, but with a flair that could also project himself in interviews. Like, he had both of those. Uh, two other guys would be oh, well, Arn Anderson, as I mentioned, and Cactus Jack. Mankind do love Mick Foley, but Cactus Jack then, because he took – a beating on a pay-per-view that I don't know if I've ever seen. It was him and Max Payne against the Nasty Boys. Spring Stampede, I want to say 94. And I just remember seeing that and going, okay, like, I don't know if this hurts. I don't really know everything. I don't get everything. But I know that he just got his ass beat. And that made me go, wow, like, I want to see more of that. Morbid, as a, as a 10- or 11-year-old kid, you know, and I want to see somebody get beat up, but to see somebody take that punishment and still come back and still be able to stand and move always stuck out with me. And to the point where when I trained and, and it was asked, you know, like, what are you thinking about doing if you wrestle? And I said, well, I want to be, I named three guys, two local Shirley Doe and Boomer Payne and Mick Foley. I said, that's the three guys I want to pattern myself after. I mean, that was just, for me, that was my goal. That was it. And I've always told people personally, I'm not a fan of deathmatch wrestling. That is a, a bit of an aside, but but it's like, if you like it, great. It, it, me not liking it doesn't affect its ability to be there, its ability to make money. But I think if I would have wrestled when I was 18 and gone down that route, I think that's the route I would have gone. Because I think there is a, a, a draw to it. I think there is a way to make money doing it. And I think just knowing the guys that I like to watch most, matches I like to watch most, I think that would have been the route that I would have gone. 
so much right there, so much. Let me rewind back to the Piper one. A uh, quick story I have. We met him two weeks before he passed away in Maryland, and he made me feel like a member of his family. I mean, he would look over the next – he's talking to, you know, the English professor, and then he's looking at me, scoping me up, looking that I have a wedding ring on, looking that I have this, looking at that. I walk up to him. He's like, hey, how's the wife and kids, this, that, the other thing. He made you feel like a member of his family and didn't talk anything about wrestling that whole time. I'm like, oh, my God, I remember this. I remember this. And he's just, you know, low-key, uh, probably the greatest – no disrespect to anybody that's been on the show or I met in person or anything, but the greatest person I've met in my life besides somebody in my family because he's humble and he knows you know where he came from and he he legit loves his fans. Absolutely, and the nice thing too, and like seeing him talk with with the boys and the girls and stuff uh, uh, that were on the show, I wasn't on the show with him, but he asked me he's like, so what, what's your name? How long have you been doing this? What do you do? And and you know what? What do you believe in yourself? And I was like, oh shit! Like I've, I've uh, 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 wasn't prepared for that. Hold on a second. And he's like, always have an answer. And I'm like, oh, damn! Oh wait, no, that's not an answer. And I saw him talking to other people, and the way he would talk, it's like you said, like a member of the family, like a father giving a talk to his son or daughter, saying, you know, this is going to be a learning lesson. This is what we're going to do. I want to make sure you're okay, but I also want to make sure you understand, which. He would have been, I think, an amazing coach or teacher. Yeah, just in that in that performance center vein, performance center vein, like a like how Dusty Rhodes was. I think Piper would have been a very very good teacher to teach how, as weirdly as it sounds in wrestling, teach people how to be themselves. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I 100% agree. Uh, the next one I want to skip to that you you brought up that you wanted to be kind of Mick Foley, Shirley Doe, Boomer Payne. Um, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? I, I, I don't know you as 14-year-old B.C. Steel, but I can't imagine that you were 550 or even 300 pounds ever to be taking bumps like that. Uh, there was not. When I started, any time there was, you know, somebody's got to take a bump, I would be like, can I do it? Well, well what if we're going to – I'll do it. Light tubes, yeah, throw me in a uh, – chair i'll gladly take it that uh, please you throw it at my face uh, just you know murder me i, I want that uh, that feeling i was also a huge fan of ecw so i think that had something to do with it like that was my mecca yeah when i was when i was a young kid i mean i mentioned earlier watching it on that saturday night block religiously every saturday if i was out with friends it's hey we got to put on a tv or okay let me make sure my vcr is going to record this yeah vcr again dating my ref or my myself but still uh just having that to, to, I need to see it. So I, I was a very small buggy whipped arm, probably couldn't punch through a paper bag uh, during my 14 and 15 year old uh, self. But I, I was good at, I don't want to say I was good at pain because nobody I think likes pain, but I was fine if it's a means to an end. Like I was fine. I don't want somebody just to punch me in the face, obviously. Right. Uh, but I mean, not so much. There's this one girl. Well, never mind. That's a whole other story. But uh, I definitely don't want punched in the face. But if I know, hey, we have to get to, you know, point C and we're at point A and I know it might take this to get there, let, let's do it and we'll deal with it afterwards and we'll just go from there. So I, I wanted that. And when I would watch local guys like Doe and, and Boomer Payne, I would go, okay, like this is this is keeping my attention. They were also guys that character-wise – had a set character, knew what their character was, didn't deviate from it, and I in no way went that route. Uh, but there have been moments where there's a part of me that's like, okay, like I feel my my 14 year old self would go, yeah, that's what I wanted to do, and then I would go, oh, okay, but my 30 some or late 20 some or whatever age some that shouldn't have done that type of thing. So. Not necessarily do I have the frame for it that I think I would need to have to do that full time. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so you started refereeing in 2001. Did you have Did you have any matches before you refereed, or did they all kind of, like, build up upon each other? Because I, I know that you're waiting for that one big blow-off in, in your life. You're going to have one big match before it's all over with. But you, you've been on the shelf, to, you know, not technically, but, you know, wrestling shelf overall for a while. Um, 
let's just start from 2001, I guess, and go. Everywhere you've been and just the floor is yours. Well, in 2001, uh, there was a lady who had run shows. Her name was Jackie. She had really, she just, she had money and she, I guess, liked the wrestling business and she would book appearances for guys. Uh, Chris Hamrick was a guy. Uh, the Backseat Boys, uh, Trent Acid and Johnny Cashmere. Um, a couple other guys, the SATs from time to time would be brought in and she would kind of book them on show. She would pay for them and, and I don't know if she got money back from, from you know, t-shirt or not t-shirt but sales of merchandise i don't know what the deal was i just know that she took a liking to me and and bobby and uh, i gotta call him potter calling yeah, bobby williams fine. bobby very weird to me so potter is bobby williams is rpw is everything so but yeah but she just took a liking to us i think because we were young and she could be like hey could you help me out here and we'd be like oh god yeah you know we'll work this guy's table we'll do this but she's the one that was like look i need a referee Joe Perry was the other referee, and he said, hey, I can't do this whole show. And I was like, well, I don't feel comfortable being a referee when I, I didn't train to be a referee. And he goes, well, you know, you, I give you my blessing. Uh, my trainer, Double Budokan, gave me his blessing. And Potter was like, look, because he, he was a ref, but he was 15. So he's like, you can do this. So off I went. And then somebody said, hey, you know, uh, PWX needs a referee. You should talk to Quinn Magnum. So I talked to Quinn Magnum, and he's like, yeah, I could use a referee, absolutely. And Sean Patrick, legendary referee in this area, yep. was all for it because he was the only referee at the time. And then from there it was CWF for Powerhouse Hughes. Hey, we need a referee. Are you interested? Sure. And, you know, Potter would be like, hey, I'm going to, you know, Mason Dixon Wrestling. Do you want to come along? Absolutely. Um, people may know Matt and Kenny. They, they run the door at IWC. They've been around forever and a day. They run Stomp Out Cancer. Uh, which is my favorite event every single year, hands down. Agreed. And that they're also, they're also my best friends. So like they would say, hey, you know, they used to run a newsletter. So they would say, hey, we're going to Ohio, and they have one referee. Bring your stuff, okay? I mean, that's the first rule of anybody in wrestling: always bring your gear. So they would get me booked in Ohio, and for years I had steady work every single weekend, two to three times. Uh, you know, the, the, and I just looked this up. I, we said before we started recording how I was keeping track of my results, and I would be like, who's that guy? Who's this guy? I just pulled one up where I wrote the details down of, you know, 1,100 miles in three days round trip, this many stops for gas. And I didn't usually put these details, but I had put, you know, here's who all was in the car, here's what I made. And when I get to that line, it gets really depressing. But at that time, it was like, wow, I got, you know, uh, 15 matches or whatever it was worth of experience over the course of three days. And wow, I, I feel like, okay, I learned one thing on this trip. Let's do it again next week. And I'll try and learn something else. And then in 2003, uh, Quinn Magnum and PWX was looking for a manager because there was a manager by the name of Damian Stockholm who had actually managed early IWC as well, but he was winding down. Quinn has always booked managers very well really wanted somebody that he could kind of use as that heater, or if he had a guy and didn't know what he wanted to do with him, hey, let's put him with this manager and let's see what they can do, and, and we'll see where that goes. So I was lucky enough to be that guy, and I will say the bookings do slow down when you're a manager because not everybody knows how to utilize or to use one properly. It's very, very difficult because you run into the risk of you can't really – do everything you can with a wrestler, but you can get a little bit more out of it when you actually do go down that road, if that makes sense. Uh, it can also be very difficult because, as one thing that used to drive me crazy, now I just accept it, I've mellowed out in my old age, some managers suck. They're just no training, they're on the yep. show because they're friends with some guy that happened to be you know, running the show, or they paid for the ring, or they did this, they did that. That used to drive me insane. Now my thing is, look, I don't care how you got in the business, I don't care if you paid dues for five years before you could even look at a ring and this is your big break. I don't care how you got in the business. Do you take it seriously once you're in? If not, get the fuck out because there's other people that can do this. But if you take it seriously, great. You know, don't don't detract, add to type of thing. Don't subtract, add to. That's my, my big thing. And so the booking slowed down, but I was also lucky enough that I had guys that would kind of help me out and I made – connection with certain guys and I had chemistry with certain guys so I could get booked and 
for Rampage, their very first show in Erie, uh, as you know, the, the Erie area. Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> the first Rampage show way back, and I want to say 2003, 2004, I got booked because of my chemistry with a guy by the name of Darren Smythe and Jamie Scott, who ran it at the time with Jeff, I can't remember his last name, had said, hey, uh, here's Jabari. I think you guys would be really good together. Do you guys want to work? I'm like, God, absolutely, because I love Jabari. So, like, hey, you're going to do this here. I'm like, cool. And then there was a show in Ohio where I managed a guy, Crusher Hansen, and the NWA president at the time, I want to say Trobich was his last name, said, you know, I heard that you guys are a tandem. Here's the show. Would you be interested? I'm like, absolutely, yes. And just kind of continued on from there. So it was nice that I had some connection so my bookings didn't outright just, you know, deteriorate. But for the most part, you know, that was my main focus. Like, I wasn't going to ref anymore. I was going to manage. Originally, I was going to wrestle, but thanks to getting dropped on my head and uh, the assistance of Luke Gallows beating the holy hell out of me, that wrestling career quickly faded. (laughs) Needless to say, that didn't happen. Perfect transition. Perfect transition, because I have that written down that you got your ass kicked in... I know we talked about it off air, but I messed it up then, so I'm going to mess it up here, too. It was like your second or third time doing anything, and it was Gallus' second match ever, right? Yeah, it was It was the first time I managed, because Quinn's thing was, I don't want to put you out on shows here and put you behind the eight ball, and you're just absolute dog shit. So go to somewhere far away, go to West Virginia, You know, do random spot shows, get some work with guys you know, and, and kind of get your feet wet. So it was Mason Dixon Wrestling in, I want to say, Anmore, West Virginia at some festival. And I was on the show, and there was a really, really big kid that was managing, or not managing, but they were showing him some stuff because he had that very, very, very minimal training. And they're like, hey, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. And he's, you know, he comes up to Potter and I and goes, so are you guys on the show? And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's my first time managing. I'm kind of nervous. I've never done this. And he goes, well, I just had one match, but this is my second match. And at the time... I, I was convinced that he was bullshitting because he goes, you know, I play college football and I have to wear a mask because if they find out that I'm doing this, I'm going to get in trouble. And I'm thinking to myself, like, that is the dumbest story I've ever heard. Like, why would you lie about that? Later I found out it was true. But he's like, yeah, you know, I'm nervous, but I love wrestling and this is what I want to do and da 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 So I get dropped on my head early on. I took a spinning Death Valley driver and instead of landing on my back, I landed like a lawn dart. Nice. It was probably three seconds, but I went numb, and I'm like, oh, that's not good. I don't feel anything. Oh, I got feeling in my legs. They hurt, so I just grabbed my legs. So landed on my head, sold my legs. Off to a great start. And they had a rule that if you were on the show, even a manager, you're going to be in the Battle Royal, which pretty much meant I was going to – guys were going to take liberties and chop and kick and mess me up. And I'm like, okay, like, I know it's happening. I'm not going to bitch and moan because I know better – uh, just going to take my lumps and we're going to accept it. And I'm going to, you know, bitch and moan internally. So guys are, you know, beating me up and I eventually get dumped over and I'm like, wow, like I can barely stand up. I'm sore, but not too, too bad. And a guy by the name of Lance Malinowski grabs me and goes, hold on, kid. We're going to work you over. I'm like, oh shit. Like this is not going to be good. And who's the guy that comes up to me, but the big lumbering guy that I met earlier, soon to be uh, known as Luke Gallows. And he goes, chop. And I'm like, okay, well, it's not like I'm going to, you know, do anything. And he punches me hard in the chest. I mean, not a chop, but just a closed fist right to the chest. And it felt like my sternum shot up through my back. And then he hits me again. And then he hits me again. And then they spin me around. The other guy beats me. And I'm like, this is not how this is supposed to go. So as we're going home, Potter and I are making the joke. I'm like, well, you know, that that kid left some welts on me, but we're never going to see that kid again. Like, that, that's probably the beginning and end of his career. And to the point where not realizing that that's who that was years later watching a tape. Yes, a tape and a VCR. And Potter goes, hey, do you know who that is? And I, he goes, it's Dorian DeVille. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, you know who Dorian DeVille is? I go, well, at the time he was Festus. He goes, yeah, that's the guy that beat the shit out of you that you said we'd never see again. And I'm like, I was wrong. Do not judge a book by its cover because he's gone on to do amazing things and is part of one of the probably most influential non-American stables of all time. So uh, to, to, to great things there, but uh, that 
that series of events and the neck and back problems that have continued up until recently uh, definitely ended my dreams of uh, a wrestling career and main eventing WrestleMania. Oh, man, I, I could see you at WrestleMania, too, bowing down like Shawn Michaels after you win the title. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've always said, and, I, and some people think I'm joking, but I am absolutely honest to God dead serious. If I could do it over, and I wouldn't change anything because I don't know. If I would change something, my life wouldn't have been where it was. But if you would have told me when I was 18, not telling me what my life would be now and just saying, hey, if you really want to do this, you know, grow your hair out hit the gym harder than you do because mine was maintenance, not performance. Uh, you know, get on human growth hormone and buy <laughs> some, some gear and do all this stuff and you'll, you know, make it because I was a scrawny kid. I needed help putting on size at that point. If somebody would have told me that, I absolutely would have done it. I have no doubt in my mind that I would have gone and done that. And I'm not telling people to do that. That is not good. There are health risks associated, et cetera. Disclaimer, do not sue, blah, 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 blah. But I definitely would have gone and done that just because the, the allure that I had back then of, of making it big and being this, this big household name were like, wow, how can I do that? Like it didn't even fathom in my brain. So if somebody would have told me that, I would have, I would have been jacked up. I, you would be doing this interview with six foot one, uh, 310 pounds of solid muscle DC steel. Right. It, you would have hit the gym and taken your ICO Pro, and you would have been a narcissist. <laughs> I would have been, or, or the narcissist, as they pronounced his name, because nobody could speak it correctly for the right. two weeks of his career. Right. Uh, that was a flop. That was horrible. Speaking of narcissists, um, prior to the show, you know, we both did our homework on each other. We've both known each other. But uh, there's a narcissist that you have to talk about a little bit because he's a piece of shit, and we call him Mandime. Oh, oh. Well, you know, it's appropriate because I would like to announce the official Man Dime fan club. Uh, I am your president and member, Benjamin C. Steele. Uh, now, I will say that because uh, Man Dime is allowing me to use his likeness in this fan club, I am legally obligated to say that Johnny Patch is a jerk face. Uh, I personally am a Johnny Patch fan, but again, legal requirements as they are, Johnny Patch is a jerk face and Man Dime is uh, so much better. Uh, in all honesty, Man Dime and Johnny Patch are uh, the gory and DJZ Shima Zion, if you will, of, of this generation. The stuff that I see Johnny Patch do, my brain can't fathom. Like when I saw him do the double rotation, shooting star, coast to coast, my brain stopped and went, no, you didn't see that. Like we're going to wipe that out of your brain. Because that way when you watch it next time, it's the first time you've seen it. And I even said to him, like, I don't know how you did that. My, I just I can't fathom it. I liken it to Too Cold Scorpio. When I watched Two Cold Scorpio do the 450, which if you watch from his debut, even the ref sells it, I saw it and went, wow, what, what the fly in hell was that? I've never seen that. Same with Johnny Patch. And Mandime is so far ahead of so many people for the short time he's been in the business. And I, I credit that as well to Zach Nystrom, who uh, with, uh, with uh, fabulous John McChesney, big league John McChesney, if you will, uh, I mean, those three, it's a shame that wrestling shows cut when they did because I think those three are going to be a force. And in 10 years, we're going to say, yeah, Man Dime and Zach Nystrom, if they're not signed by that point, so we'll say five years, we're going to say, hey, they got their start and they really came into their own when they were with John McChesney. So just a, just a, a, an aside to put everybody over uh, in that group, big fan. Also a big fan of the Dime piece as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, very big fan, you know. She, uh, she, she's, she's, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan. What can I say? Who isn't a big fan of the dime? Because we love her. And uh, dime piece, dime piece knows I love her, but uh, man, dime as well. We've had both them on the show, and I referenced it as it's today's, you know, local flair versus steamboat. Because I don't care if in five years they're not signed, it's blasphemy. But if they're having another match over anything, uh, a whipped cream container, I don't care. They put on a goddamn good show, let me tell you. It's a thing you can see over and over and over. and you can. It, I liken it to the John Cena-Randy Orton that we saw. It, for the, not saying that they're John Cena and Randy Orton. I know that's – I'm sure there's going to be somebody, oh, my God, he said they're Cena and Randy Orton. What the hell? That, but just 
using that comparison that we saw so many John Cena and Randy Orton matches. And yes, I do think fans got bored with them, but they were always doing something different. There was always a little twist or always a little bit of a, okay, you saw all of this, but now we're going to throw this in there and we're going to make it completely different. And that's how I see Johnny Patch and Mandime. And it helps that they train together because you're going to see, I mean, they're always going to be compared to one another. I, there's people that still compare DJZ and Gory, I'm sure, or Punk and Cabana, or, you know, insert two guys here that ended up traveling around together when they started. Yeah. Uh, you just name dropped a shit ton of names and you shared the locker room with all of them. Uh, do you have any great locker room stories about any of them? Uh, I always credit when I started, uh, CM Punk and Cole Cabana one, because you don't got a name drop, but, uh, (laughs) to not sound like a tool, but they were guys that would actually give advice. It wasn't, I was always taught, ask, you know, make sure you didn't do anything wrong. Find out how you did. And I would say, Hey, how did I do? Sometimes guys go, oh, you did great, kid. Nothing was wrong. Thanks. And then they'll just walk off. And I'm like, okay, well, they probably didn't pay attention or didn't care or whatever. Punk at Cabana would actually give advice, especially CM Punk. Uh, two things he told me, literally pulling me aside, showing me another referee and said, hey, do you see how he doesn't tuck his shirt in? Yeah, don't do that. Do you see how he's not as tall? Don't do that. And I'm like, wait, I, I shouldn't be tall? And he's like, you're taller than I am, so slouch down because you make me look like a piece of shit. And when you tuck in your shirt, it looks like you're grabbing your dick, and the focus shouldn't be on you grabbing your dick. I'm like, oh, oh shit, that's a good point. Like that, that makes so much sense. This is this is amazing. So like, I totally get that. But they were like two guys that would constantly help, just actually give advice. I know Cabana used to say a thing that no matter how funny he is, try not to smile. Try try and be that you know center of the road. What you are, you know, you're here for to keep law and order, not to play favorites, which kind of hard to do that around Cabana because he's a genuinely entertaining individual and very, very happy to see him on Wednesday nights. But just always cool to see that and always cool to see guys progress. Like I mentioned John McChesney before. When I first saw him, I think he was 19, and he was probably, I would say, maybe 130 pounds. And he was doing stuff that was, you know, above – where where par was he was definitely above that he was better than where you would expect him to be and to see him evolve was super cool seeing people that are are still younger well younger than i am in the business but still seeing how they've progressed in the last five years like gannon jones jr duke davis uh, even jack pollock to an extent even though that was nine years ago that he had debuted eight or nine uh guys like rc dupree and jackson argos uh guys like and i i obviously i managed them so i'm a little bit partial but uh, Calvin Couture, who was handpicked, legitimately handpicked by RPW and myself, as like this is somebody we want to work with. Uh, Tyler Klein, who I've only had a minimal interaction with, just because I just started managing him. But to see that and to see the girls as well. Uh, for people that don't know, women's wrestling in this area for a long time was either cat fights or if girls were brought in, they would have a match, or girls beating me up which I don't think there's, well, I'm sure there's a draw to it and appeal to some people, but not so much to me because that's not fair to them. But seeing now you've got all the girls that are in this area with, with Ray Lynn and Katie Urquette and Ziggy Heim and Badger and Laura Loveless. And even though she is, she's gone on to, to Texas, London Ali, who is now, I believe, Promise Braxton, I think. I may have flipped the, the names there, but... Uh, just so, 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 so much talent. Jocelyn, who's in Ohio, and, and I could go on and on and on. I'll be here all day singing the praises. But just to see how that kind of evolves, like that's the cool thing to me, to see where somebody starts and then to see, okay, further down the line, where do they end up? And like, wow, I remember them way back when type of thing. Yeah, the ones that we bring up all the time, uh, Ray Lynn's a great friend of the show calvin as much as he hates me because i don't dress well he loves us um britain wardlow i you know you kind of forgot them uh logan shulo aj styles i mean all these guys have made their way through pittsburgh wrestling and they're all something from you know pittsburgh i still consider it you know little compared to some of the other places you know Pittsburgh wrestling is not little anymore. It is just, it's a mecca center for pumping out talent. I mean, it really is. If you want to go back to the Bruno San Martino through the 
Shane Douglas, the Kurt Angles, the the Corey Graves, the I mean, everywhere from then on in between and in the future. We've talked about guys five years from now. I want to see where they're at. And I'm sure when Wardlow started, people were like, I want to see where he's at in five years or ten years. And we see where he's at. And granted, partial Pittsburgh guys, so you kind of maybe uh, romanticize it a little bit. But I would not be surprised if he is one of their top guys in two, three years, like on that natural progression to be that guy. And I think Britt Baker finding her own as – I don't a know bitch. if it's the face of the a women's bitch. division. But she's a bitch, but we, it's perfect for her. But she's so good. And role model is the greatest thing. And, and I don't know if it was by accident or just, you know, if that was a design whenever she had suffered her injury. But that makes me happy to watch. Yeah. All right, let's take a minute away from wrestling and get over uh, some of these stupid questions that the other guys want to ask you that uh, aren't here, but they send them in anyway. Um, you're very quick-witted with the fans. Uh, you, you've buried us a few times. But uh, has that come naturally, or is that a part of, like, the training that you went through? Because we could say something to you, and you're just like, you're an asshole. And it fits perfectly. It, it really does. Uh, it, it, when I started, no. When I started, my, my thing was always sometimes I would have a response, but usually it was like, here's the line, and you just went four miles down the road. Or other times it would be I would say something, and it was like, in my head, I was like, that was dumb. I look like an idiot. I'm going to turn around now. But being quick-witted is, is definitely part of it. I've always had the ability to have a response. It's very, very rare that I get tripped up. The only time I really get tripped up now is if somebody says something, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with that, case in point, and I love telling the story. I had a gentleman yell at me one time, and he I think he went to say he was going to hook up with my mother, but the way he said it is that I was going to hook up with his mother. And to be honest, when somebody says that to you, I, you really don't have a response to it. So I just kind of stared at him, and I said, I'm going to turn back around now because you need to think about your life. So, And I may have insinuated that I was his natural-born father anyway. <laughs> But quick-witted definitely comes with it. And for anybody that wants to be a manager, if you're not quick-witted, you better learn soon because all it takes is one, maybe two times of being put in your place, and you're screwed. You're dead in the water. You're, you're that dude. So as a heel, you can show your ass, so to speak, literally or figuratively. But uh, if, if you do it from the wrong person, then you're probably going to be sunk. So it goes with the territory, and I pride myself on always having a response, and you can ask any girl that's ever dated me sometimes that's very very annoying but it kind of is what it is and uh yeah kind of com comes with the territory of what i do and who i am uh, yeah you've married us a few times uh what's the worst job you've ever had I, my son likes to know stuff about stupid things so uh he always likes to know this so that was ethan's that is that is a good question uh the worst job i've ever had is probably also one of the most intriguing uh for lack of going into great detail, I was essentially a, an investigator. I was set to look into people's lives and make sure that what they had stated on a legal document and form is actually the truth. And there are various avenues. I wouldn't, you know, tail them or or be reviewing them or, or, or you know, hiding in the bushes trying to check them out. But on social media through uh, legal avenues that I would be able to look into that I could see to find out, okay, you said A, B, C, and D, and does that match up with what I'm seeing? So you really, really learn a lot, but the reason it's probably the worst job was I would see people that were not exactly smart and could have easily hidden stuff and not gotten in trouble and would not be facing legal consequence, but just didn't have the brains to do so. And that's one of the reasons, and I know that sometimes I sound like an old man when I say this, but it's one of the reasons why I think locally in all of independent wrestling, guys should be a lot better and girls should be a lot better on social media because what you put out there is what's going to stay there and what you put out there is viewed in a certain light that you don't have control over. And as somebody that used to have to investigate people and look back into people's history, one little tweet or one little thing can really kill you. And there's the fact that you should look a certain way if you're in the wrestling business. And sometimes, to me, if you're supposed to be this 
superstar larger than life and somebody that people want to pay to see, why should I care if you hate your job, if you're sad because nobody will date you, and your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, didn't text you back and you're miserable? I mean, me personally, if Stone Cold Steve Austin back in the day tweeted that he was upset because his wife was mad at him and posted thing like, hey, I love kittens. Well, in my mind, that's going to stick out in my mind every time I see him. I'm like, oh, that's the guy that loves kittens. Like, uh, okay. To me, when I'm watching Breaking Bad, you don't have Walter White or Brian Cranston jump in the middle and say, hey, guys, uh, just wanted to let you all know that uh, I had a burger and fries for lunch, and it really wasn't that good. But uh, you're watching Breaking Bad. It's like, well, wait a minute. You're, you're in the middle of a scene. Stop. Hold on. So... <laughs> That's that's a, a rant for another time, but uh, because I would we would be here all day, and this would be a twelve part series on BC Steel analyzes social media, and I'm not saying that I'm not uh, immune to that. I have had times where I've tweeted stuff, and I'm, I look back and I'm like, ah, that was stupid. And I've had people call me on my stuff, and I'm like, yeah, you know what, you're right. I I dropped the ball on that one. Let me go back and, and redo it or delete it or you know try and get better next time. So that's a good question. I so, might steal that question if I ever release a podcast episode again, which probably isn't going to happen. But I definitely might steal that question. We'll, we'll get there on your podcast because I want to. I want to know some more stuff about the podcasting thing. Um, so between you and Dan Hooven, you could have been the greatest investigators in the world. Private dicks. Absolutely. Right. I mean, he, you know, he, he's doing uh, <laughs> doing uh, paranormal investigations, and I'm doing best term i can think of criminal investigations i'm not doing criminal investigations but that's the best way i can word it so i mean maybe in another life we could have been a tag team the the private eyes yeah uh if you could undo one moment in your life what would it be oh good lord oh my uh well i I said before i i would hate to change anything because if i change it then i don't know where i'm at now but in 2000 whatever year it was joe dombrowski offered me a chance to go to england he wanted to use three referees in rotation bryce remsburg myself and rpw bobby williams potter and i turned it down because of the commitments i had here at the time i said i just i can't do it because i'm giving up too much those commitments ended shortly after everybody had gone over to england and obviously it was too late for me to say hey can you change everything and fly me over there but that is the one thing where I'm like, you know what? I should have just said this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go to England to referee in England with all these people and all this stuff and all this opportunity that I wish I would have gone and done it. And finally, yeah, damn it. If, if you get the chance to go there, you, you need to. I've never been, but I, I've had family that went over just just because it's beautiful over there, and I'd like to see wrestling over there. But I digress. Um this, this is where, uh, it's not the silly thing. It really isn't. Uh, take a moment away from wrestling, away from everything, and uh, send everybody in the world, and this is where we can see how good you are at promos. You get 30 seconds. Give the world a message right now about what the hell is going on in the world. That's simple. If you've, and we're going to get deep. If yeah. You, if you are like me, I am 36. I am a straight white male. Nobody has ever judged me on the color of my skin, my sexual orientation, how I look, how I act, or any preconceived notions that they have about me. If you haven't talked to somebody that is outside of that, that has a darker skin tone than you, that has a different sexual preference than you, that is even a different gender, because being a man, it's kind of an easy life. Have that conversation. Find out what they're going through. Find out how they view things, and then that can affect your worldview, even if you don't understand it. Just hearing it from another person makes it a lot different. And the story I always give is when I managed Shane Taylor, him and I had a conversation once of just life in general, and he explained to me how our lives were different. And he had said it in a way that without going through the whole conversation, said, you might empathize, you might want to understand, but you will never be in my shoes. So as much as I respect your desire to, just know that you can't experience it. And I, I, I had sit, sat back and said, you know what? I never looked at it as anything more than, yeah, I know what you're going through. I don't. And that's the thing I think that if people took that extra 10 seconds and said, okay, let me try and understand what that person's going through. And if I know I can't do it, maybe I need to take a step back and just listen more than uh, talk. 
Well said. All right, back back to wrestling. And we're going to start right in with some, some dirt. We want to know some of your locker room drama. Uh, we're going to go along, and I don't give a shit. You don't give a shit. You said you had until tomorrow anyway. So uh, let's, hear, let's hear some locker room drama. Uh, I know you have some good stories from – you shared the locker room with freaking Buff Bagwell once, so come on. I did. Uh, my favorite, funny you mentioned him, uh, my favorite Buff Bagwell moment, uh, J.T. Lightning for Cleveland, late great J.T. Lightning, used to give uh, speeches before the show, and he was talking about uh, just you know how being appreciative of what you're doing because you don't know when it's going to go away. And he said, no matter how great you think it is, it could end. And he gave the example of WCW, and he said, Buff Bagwell's here a year ago or two years, whatever the time was, he was in front of 20,000 people in the Georgia Dome, now he's here in Cleveland, Ohio, in front of four or 500, and Buff Bagwell, you know, he nods, and he goes, well, you know, I mean, when you have, Bo- or, uh, not Booker T, when you have Stevie Ray making $500,000 a year, you, stuff's going to end pretty quickly, and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like that, that, was, that was kind of a shot, it just threw me off, and he goes, and for the record, I'm, I texted Stevie Ray, he knows I said this, so... Actually, Buff Bagwell, that's another one I forgot that I had shared a locker room with, but pretty pretty funny dude. Uh, locker room drama, I have seen uh, someone get slapped so hard by a girl that it looked like it came out on the other side and then smacked them on the other side of the face because there was a lot of anger and rough feelings involved. Um, the funniest drama that I've personally ever been a part of this is going back to 2001, way, way back. Uh, Potter and myself were going to have a match. We did. And then we were building up for a uh, false count anywhere, no disqualification, hardcore match. At the time, this was on Live Journal, which, again, if you've seen the pattern, I'm dating myself. Uh, people on Live Journal were doing that vague posting where they weren't mentioning us directly, but they were saying enough that you knew exactly what they were talking about. And it wasn't Shirley Doe, but it was some of his friends that were just like, you know, there's these two kids that are going to probably do every finisher imaginable and ruin the business and destroy the business, and they should be ashamed, and they should this, that, and the other. And I'm like, okay, nobody's come to us and asked us what this match is going to be. Like, they don't know what we're going to do in this match. And to be honest, the match was literally going to be, I cut a minute-long promo saying I'm the hardcore of all hardcore. I'm going to destroy Bobby, well, Harold Potter at that point here in this ring, and he's going to you know, kiss my feet and blah, blah, blah. I turn around, he hits me, matches over, it's 10 seconds. And then I'm off to do whatever the hell. But because, you know, people were running their mouth and, and all this vague posting bullshit, there was a, I guess, a hullabaloo amongst like 10 people that was made to be a bigger deal. I've told her, she's a friend of mine, so she knows that I tell the story. Stacy Hunter took this information to the booker of the company we were supposed to work. He pulled us aside and said, you know, I uh, just wanted to let you know, oh, this is awkward, but I understand I have a lot of heat in Pittsburgh, and I don't want heat in Pittsburgh, and, and I can't can't let you guys do this match. So we ask, are, are you gonna are you gonna work in Pittsburgh? Like, are you afraid? He goes, No, I just I just don't want people to be mad at me. And I'm like, But but like they're they're nobodies. They're they're guys that aren't gonna pay to see your show. They're not the majority of people. This is gonna be ten seconds. And he's like, Well, no, no, that's that's not the case. Uh, I just don't want it. So you're not doing it. And I'm like, Wow. So. Potter and myself had words with Stacy, and then uh, had a few words with the people that had had been, I guess, causing the problems. But to me, that's a, 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 a microcosm of a, a much bigger problem. Where if somebody would have went up to us, we would have said, "Look, it's not what you think it is. It's just hokey bullshit. It's going to take ten seconds. We're not going to kill the wrestling business, and you know, be a stain on the world of professional wrestling. It is what it is. We're going to move on." But People started talking, didn't go to the source, and then it blew up to this greater thing. And any time I've seen drama, not just in the wrestling business, but life in general, that's normally where it stems from. If you talk to the person where the drama emanates and find out exactly what's going on, then everything else gets washed away. And that's why I try to – if I hear somebody say, oh, you know, so-and-so said this about you, I, I don't care. Or somebody said something about you, I don't care. Who was it? Well, I can't tell you. Well, then it doesn't matter to me because it's just a nameless face. Like, I don't care if somebody doesn't think that I'm everything that I say I am. I don't care if somebody thinks that I'm no good. If the people that I associate with do, if the people that run shows think I'm good, that I work for, then I'm more than happy. Everybody else can just kind of go F themselves. So 
there's the drama. I mean, you have guys that kind of argue and stuff like that before. I almost saw CM Punk and Loki get into a fight one time in the ring, which uh, there would have been no stopping them because, well, I'm not going to stop anybody. So cooler heads did prevail, but uh, there was a tense moment. I'm like, oh, this drama is going to get bad. This is going to pop off, and and I'm not going to do a thing because I'm 18 years old, and I'll probably uh, poop my pants if they start throwing fists. So, yeah, here we go. But thankfully, cooler heads prevailed, and there wasn't a fight. Although, he, CM Punk did almost fight a drunk fan that night, which, unfortunately, that did not happen either. Those are always great. Uh, I, I had so much in my mind until you said drunk fan. Um I, I don't condone it. I don't condone being drunk at wrestling events. I think it's more for the entertainment and, you know, to release your mind and everything. You can have a couple beers, cool, if they sell them, but don't get that far because I've seen way too many people crawl in the ring and then just get pummeled, and I love that. If you're that stupid to crawl in the ring during uh, an event, you, you wouldn't jump up on a Broadway play. Why You're not going to run across field on baseball. Stay out of their stage. Uh, we always yeah. say that. You're, you're jackasses. And if it comes down to it and it's you against a wrestler, there's a good chance it's going to be you against the entire locker room. Right. And, I mean, you hear stories back from the Mid-South days where if they did drag a fan to the back, that fan was dealt with and made sure that he never did that again. And charges weren't pressed because back then, I don't think everybody was you know, as litigious as they are now. And on top of that, it, the wrestlers weren't going to dime each other out, so there wasn't going to be an issue. So uh, I've seen guys attempt to do that. I've had a fan come after me, and I've seen a fan try and get in the ring, and four guys just beat the holy hell out of him, to my entertainment, because I was the referee but didn't feel the need to break that up, because, again, I'm not going to be breaking anything up. No. Um Let's go to where we ran into you first. It was in IWC. You, Chris LaRusso was just coming in. You had Bulk Nasty as well. You, you kind of had uh, this unstoppable force. Uh, no pun to Bulk Nasty, but you guys were just running amok in IWC. And then all of a sudden, BC, uh, I hope this doesn't do anything between me and Plummer, but... Why the hell did you leave? Um, and I, I don't want you to be PC. Um, what what the hell happened? Because you were there, and then holy shit, you were gone. What happened in IWC? Well, it's it's been two, three years, I think, and I still don't have a concrete answer. I can tell you exactly what had happened. I missed the month before because my back was kind of acting up, and I was like, hey, I'm going to miss like one show. Balk and Chris weren't on the show anyway, so it's not like I was needed there on the show. I'm like, but then, you know, come May, we're good to go. Everything's happy, whatever. So uh, I texted Chris. I said, hey, do you want to get together this week at the school? We can do an interview for this match. We can do whatever we're going to do, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see where we're at. And I know Balk was away at the time, so we were going to circle around back to that, I thought, later on. And I texted Chris that Thursday. I said, I can come down tomorrow. We can put something up the day before the show. And it, it was either two days before or nine days before, but it was that Thursday before the show. I don't remember the exact time. And I got told flat out, hey, you're not needed. Uh, I'm joining Labar, and we're going to have you come back down the line, and here's this whole deal. And I looked at my fiance at the time, and she looks at me. She goes, are you all right? You look like you know somebody just uh, dropped a bombshell. And I said, I just got hosed. Like, I completely got hosed. She goes, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not needed for Saturday. And she goes, are your guys not on the show? And I said, no, 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 Chris is on the show. And she goes, well, what about you? And I said, I'm apparently not needed. And it was such just a weird uh, change in what was going on. I've heard uh, stories that people thought that, oh, well, they thought you were hurt, which if that were the case, you would come to me and ask me. Uh, I've heard people say that, uh, you know, they want you to come back. It, we just got to find the right thing, which that was two years ago. Uh, here's here's the long and the short of it. My best friend is there. Uh, somebody who is a mentor to me is is, is in IWC is kind of like a, I don't want to say office, because that's a weird way to put it, but part of the office and helping make things run smoothly. Uh, five or six guys that I personally put over to Plumber that he should use are there. And I'm not. So that tells me one of three things. Either one, I pissed somebody off, which I don't think happened because I've never heard anything. Two, 
I don't really fit, and I'm sorry, but I don't buy that one either, because one, I am as good as I say I am. You are. Two, uh, thank you. Two, bulk, Chris and I, I thought there was a lot more money left on the table. I said the first night I was there, bulk should be a main eventer. Bulk should be, you know, not pandering to people. Bulk should be his own man. And bulk should be more of what I see behind the curtain. Like, that guy is money, and I don't. if nobody else sees it, then I'll just, you know, we'll go to bat for it. I told Chris my first night that's what's going to happen. So I thought there was money there. Plus, I like working with young guys. I feel that I can work with just about anybody. So the third one it could be somebody doesn't want me there. Uh, I don't know if it was Chris because he's the one that, you know, pitched this grand plan and grand idea that I said that night probably wasn't going to happen and clearly didn't. Uh, it could be Plumber because at the end of the day, it's his company. And I've talked to him. I've given ideas. I've been told, hey, we're going to use you. I've been told, uh, you know, uh, there's going to be something coming up. We'll bring you back. I've been told a number of stuff. I've been told, hey, you know, these guys really, really want to bring you in, which is great, and I appreciate people saying that, but the only person I know directly because I saw the proof that actually went to bat for me was Potter. He flat out went to bat for me and said, here's a guy who's got this talent who can work with guys, who can make them better, who can help guys out. Why are we not using him? And... I can only go from there. If Plummer doesn't want me there, that's totally fine. It, it's his sandbox. It, I, I'm i not going to go on social media and tag him and say, oh, I got screwed over. This is the worst thing that ever happened. Screw him. It's his company. And as a promoter, he's got 50 million messages. He's got uh, probably you know 30 unread texts. He's got guys that are on the show. He's got guys that aren't on the show that want to be on the show. He's got the you know, the ring that he has to worry about, the building, the the license, the state, especially now with everything going on. So if he doesn't have time to get back to me, understandable. But I would expect and hope for the same respect that I showed him when I worked there to be returned to me. And that is, hey, look, just this is what happened. It is what it is. Because I know when Bulk came back, I was told, you know, we were going to bring you in bulk back in the fall. It just didn't happen. We had to bring him back now, but we're going to circle back with you. Great. Not a problem. Totally cool. I didn't even know we were going to bring bulk and I back in the fall. Nobody told me. But if that's what you said was going to happen, that's fine. Like, we'll, we'll just come back to it and we'll go from there. And then all this time happens, all this time happens. I send I, two or three ideas like, hey, we could do this, we could do that. Nothing happens. So short answer, I have no idea what happened because nobody has ever told me. Um, if he doesn't respect my work, that's fine. Like I said, it's his sandbox. If he doesn't want to use me or Brandon K or Dr. Feelbad or Fight Underground or ABC Company in West Virginia, if somebody doesn't want to use me, that's totally their prerogative because the one thing that Quinn Magnum, who I've said for years was like an older brother, a mentor of mine, one thing he always told me was it's not your money. And if it's not your money, you don't have the final say. So no matter how good you think your idea is, no matter – how you fit, no matter how perfect you feel you might be, you aren't the final say, and you need to understand that. And I was like, okay, like I, I get that. I fully accept that. And it took me a long time to learn because I can be stubborn, but I learned that, and I went, okay, so if somebody you know, wants to use somebody else over me, fine. There, there's enough places I have to work and enough places I have to go. It just bothers me to an extent because, one, I, as I said, I did feel that LaRusso, myself, and Bulk were a good mix. I did feel that there was a lot more stuff that could be done, especially with Bulk. I liked having Bulk Nasty, who I could be that kind of Paul Heyman with Brock Lesnar, not comparing us to them, but just saying I could be that Paul Heyman with Brock Lesnar. And then I had Chris LaRusso that I could be that Paul Heyman with CM Punk, where I was more the guy holding up the title and speaking his praises, and, I, and I'm doing the intro while he does the, the, the music and then I do the chorus uh, intermittently. Where with Bulk, I could maybe be the composer and I could, you know, try and move down that road, et cetera, et cetera. And there was maybe five to ten guys that I would have and still would love to work with because I see the talent, I see the ability, and they have a hell of a training school and I see the talent that they have there too. So, yeah, so I don't know what happened. I three years later have gotten an answer and I'm sure at this point it's out of sight, out of mind. And I'm so far down on the pecking order and down on the list of things to worry about. I highly doubt we're ever going to get to it, but 
you know, in retrospect, I had a fun two years. I got to work with Tatanka, which is a random name. I got to nice. <laughs> uh, be, in, be in the ring with Adam Cole. I got to, as Chris LaRusso says, I got to assault Ricky Steamboat live in the ring. You did? Uh, I got to, uh, you know, I got to be a part of Super Indie, which was really cool because I ref the first one back in 2001, so that was kind of neat. I got to do commentary for War Games, which is super fun because I love War Games. Because I had been back to IWC twice doing commentary, but there was never an explanation of where do I fit in going forward. So, so yeah, uh, I would say never say never because that's kind of the way to go in wrestling. But unless something drastically changes, I've only heard lip service and just random rumors for the last three years. So. Hey, maybe if all else fails, I'll uh, I'll buy the company and just uh, change it to BC Steel Wrestling. Oh, all right. First of all, boom, head blown up over that. Uh, nothing against the plumbers. That would be great. Uh, I want the plumbers to have something as well because great friends there. Um, maybe this puts a little spark under Justin's ass if uh, somebody says, oh, Mark did this because he's a real douchebag and he wants BC Steel back. I don't know, but... That's my little push to get you back in IWC, but you are in Rise. Let's talk a little bit more about Rise. You, uh, before the pandemic, um, you got our boy Calvin. Uh, man, we love Calvin. Against Potter, you know, come on, let's uh, just say this. You're kind of breaking up a little bit. What the hell's going on in Rise, and what do we expect when you guys come back? Well, the I will say the uh, Golden Sheik International, uh, Robert Parker Williams, uh, uh, agreement or, or partnership ended with me sabooing a chair at his head. Uh, so, so that is definitely gone. And I, and I think the boots are potentially hung up for uh, Robert Parker Williams, but it's just moving forward with golden Sheik international with Calvin Couture, uh, Tyler Klein and Mambo Italiano, who I neglected to mention earlier. I apologize. I'm a huge Mambo fan, but that's another guy that uh, was just excited and was like, okay, let me, let me see a guy that I think has something that I could do something with. He's a guy I saw when I was in IWC, and I was like, give him an opportunity, and he will do something. And I feel that way about Calvin. I feel that way about Tyler. Give them time. Give them an opportunity to do something, and they're going to prove that they deserve that. They're going to prove that they're able to go forward. So moving forward, whenever Rise comes back, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, Golden Sheik International, I think. You're going to have a little bit more of an aggressive side, which – We've seen out of Calvin over the, the time. We, we've seen with Mambo, uh, and, and we were really finding that stride. And then, unfortunately, we were all so powerful that it took a global pandemic to put us down. So, you know, that that will tell you as my voice cracks, because, yes, you can go through puberty at 36. <laughs> uh, that, is, uh, that is what you will see going forward, and that is what you're going to see uh, definitely for 2021 or whenever we get back into the – world of independent wrestling i feel that myself because i legitimately do have a 141 iq i am not the super genius mark madden i don't claim to be but i will be the almost super genius bc steel so i feel like i need to use that even more to my uh, advantage and also to tell people because it's one thing to know you're smart but it's also something and i'm sure you understand this is a highly intelligent individual yourself it's another thing to let people know that you are that intelligent so they have something to strive for. And that's, that's I think, the BC Steel goal going forward is to let people know that they may not be as smart as me, but they can learn and eventually give themselves something to work towards. That's something for me to strive for now. I, 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 I am not where you are, but I could strive to be close to you. That, but, that's... you know... I, the Mensa chapter does have Benjamin C. Steele as a member, and we are always uh, taking on Mensa. By the way, not currently associated with the uh, the Man Dime fan club, but uh, potentially soon. Potentially, uh, I don't know where to go next. Let's uh, let's talk about Mambo for one second because I love Mambo Italiano. Uh, I want to give him his praise. He had his WWE tryout a few months ago now. Um, he deserves it, man. For what he's done, he he's unbelievable. I just have one bitch. He uh he changed his theme song. Uh, his theme song now sucks. He needs to continue to come out there. Hey, Mumbo, that it fits him so much better. <laughs> you know, when you have a theme song that has part of your name in it, it's kind of hard to go wrong, right? I mean, you, you just you, I mean that's what that's what you have. But Mumbo is definitely a guy that 
there's something about him, and I don't totally know what it is, but there's something about him where I'm like, all right, I want to see more. I want to, I want to know what's going on. I want to see more. I want to see him in this situation and that situation, et cetera, et cetera. And he's a guy that, I mean, when you think about it, he came from Italy legitimately, and, and not to confuse the people, but I did have somebody uh, when Mambo was in the ring and I was at ringside tell me that he's not even from Italy, and I just looked like, really? You think that's a fake accent? And I was like, you know what? You're right. He's actually from Detroit. You got me. So, But he, he moved from Italy. He came here to the States to live his dream. Uh, he's He takes it seriously. He's in the gym constantly. He's in the ring constantly. Like He's a guy that wants it, and he's a guy that deserves it. And to be honest, he's also a guy that when you're at that level, when you're uh, you know, multilingual, I know he speaks English, he speaks uh, Italian, and perhaps he speaks a third language, I'm not sure. Uh, anybody in Europe, because they're normally smarter than Americans, I can always assume there's at least two languages, potentially a third or a fourth. So, I mean, look at, look at uh, Cesaro speaking like seven languages. So... And you know what, maybe that's what Mambo could be. Maybe he could be that version where he's a guy that, okay, hey, we're going to go to Europe. Let's, we need a guy in Italy. You know, who are we going to have do local media? Hey, Mambo. Mambo speaks the language. He knows the area. He knows, you know, he's their countryman. Let's get him in there and, and let's, you know, give him a, a time to shine, especially on that grand stage. So I hope it happens. Again, it, it's, it's unlucky timing for this to happen. And then you have this, the, the pandemic, but once this opens up, I think there might be some hiring, especially you have AEW going on, uh, you have Impact, you have Ring of Honor. So I, I think once wrestling comes back, it, everything's going to be firing on all cylinders right out of the gate. People are going to be hungry for it, and that's going to lead to more jobs. And if Mambo does do it, I'm going to take uh, one half of 1% credit. Uh, I'm going to name drop him, and I'm going to tag him in everything humanly possible. So everybody be prepared. Right. I, I'm trying to get him on the show. Uh, I really am, so I can take the other half of that half a percent that you're going to be having. So, yeah. Hey, uh, and I will not I will not ask for his royalties when the Mambo Italiano figure comes out. They, those are all his. Well, I agree. I agree. Uh, so you brought up a little bit of wrestling today. Briefly, how much wrestling do you watch now? Um, have it be NWA, ROH, you know, everything you just named. What's your favorite one out there? Uh, I'm intrigued by AEW. Granted, wrestling is different when there's not fans. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just, it just makes for a different animal. But I think AEW having some of their performers in the crowd, it gives you a chance to maybe create a little bit more story than you normally would because you have your fellow people in the crowd. Uh, it gives you kind of a different, uh, a different coat of paint that you can use, so to speak. So you have that. I'm very interested in the talent they use. There's guys that are growing on me. I admit the first time I saw the Young Bucks years ago, didn't get it, didn't understand it. Same with Kevin Steen, didn't get it, didn't understand it. And then Jesse Forney, uh, Jesse the Mark, IWC yep. DJ, people probably know, also run Stomp Out Cancer, another one of my best friends. He kind of set me right on what makes Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens now, obviously, and the Young Bucks, like what makes them what they are. And then when I sat back and looked, and oh, wow, these guys are amazing. They're doing stuff that nobody else does. Now... I look at a guy like Orange Cassidy and Marco Stunt. The first time I saw them, didn't get it, didn't want to get it. I didn't hate them because there's a place for everybody, but just didn't really understand it. And then as I saw more and more, I'm like, okay, I want to, I need to see more. I need to know more. These guys are, I think, personally, have potential to be a face of a company. Uh, Chris Statlander on, on the, the female side of things is one that I'm like, okay, so she's an alien, but she's doing this. And then when I would watch her in ring and watch stuff, I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, it, granted, at 36, it's a, it takes a little bit more time for me to come around and sometimes have an open mind on things, but I love watching AEW. I like the young talent. I've seen a little bit of NWA power. Uh, I like that old-school feel of it. I really, really do. When I try and kick back, it's always ECW. I could watch Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn every single day of the week and twice on Sunday. Uh, I try and watch local stuff as well. Uh, special shout out to indie wrestling.us and the indie wrestling.us network so you can go there and check out local wrestling i just try and find as much as i can i honestly i dvr raw and smackdown and i watch it in bits and pieces that's just kind of my, my schedule I, I fill in enough to know kind of what's going on but i may not have you know everything down pat 
And another thing I've tried to do is watch some of my stuff and watch some of my old stuff and watch my guys and see if there's anything that I can pick up of, you know, why did I do that? Why didn't I do this? Or why did he do that? Why did he not do this? How can I help that out in the future? So if I see that scenario again, I can kind of cut it off at the pass and make sure that mistake isn't made. And same with managing stuff. Bobby Heenan, Jim Cornette, Paul Heyman. I've been on a Paul Heyman kick recently, trying to find his interviews and promos and how he speaks and just his cadence and stuff. So trying to find a hodgepodge of wrestling and embarrassed to say I do enjoy bad wrestling. Uh, I don't think people should pay for it because you don't, you shouldn't have your intelligence insulted, but there's just something about watching bad wrestling that just warms my heart because I can watch it and go, you know what? My matches might've been bad, but they're not that. And that makes me feel better. That's a great point. It really is. I put that towards, Podcasts, and we'll get to your podcast. Not saying your podcast was bad. That was not a reference at all. God, that <laughs> horrible transition. But uh, oh, it's had its moments. Believe me. Uh, so well, we have to. But I, I do the same thing with podcasts. Like maybe in three weeks, I'll go back and listen to this interview. And I'm like, Mark, you're a jackass for what you said right there. Probably this moment right now, at an hour and twenty two <laughs> minutes. But. You go back, and everybody does have a wrestling podcast. I'm not going to disrespect anybody. There's some that we get along with. There's some that have legit stolen stuff right from us. But I, I'm like, man, uh, I, I'm one guy or, or three guys on the weekend, and you just you adapt to everything that you've done wrong to get better. And that's why we have kind of, you know, we're, we're from, you know, central Pennsylvania, we have a cult following now of two to 4,000 people listening to this shit show every week, and that says something for a little wrestling. We're not busted open. For the love of God, we're not busted open. We're not Jericho or anything like that, but we get numbers. Which is, uh, I think everybody who's ever done a podcast needs to uh, put a special shout-out to Colt Cabana, who was the, oh, for the sure. start of that. Yeah, I mean, and to be honest, if you look at it with Colt Cabana and One Hour Tees and that launching uh, with the Bullet Club shirts, and, and in a way, you could kind of thank him for AEW as well. I mean, if you go back and connect the dots, I mean, it starts with Colt Cabana and his podcast and his numbers and starting to grow and everything in between and just kind of making it what it is now. So, but the thing about podcasts is everybody seems to have one. Yeah, anymore. Uh, and that, yeah. again, no disrespect, a lot of people have them. I can think of five that were in this area. The key is finding something that makes you go, okay, yeah, that's different. Uh, like you guys, you don't just focus on wrestling. Like you're asking different questions. When I did mine, admittedly, I stole it wasn't a wrestling podcast, but it was a uh, a sports podcast. A friend of mine uh, works for the NFL, and I had talked to him about stuff. And just talking with him, I was like, oh, you know what, I'm going to look this up before I talk to him about it. I ended up finding a podcast. And they would interview random people, and they had a five-question segment. They would just ask five questions that weren't necessarily wrestling, and they would say, plug something. It doesn't have to be you. Just plug anything. So I was like, okay, nobody's heard this podcast, so I'm going to steal it, and we'll move on. Like, we'll, we'll take it from there. I, I kind of go back to the Jim Cornette line that if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. But if you steal from a bunch of people, it's research. So if you can take elements of different places and craft it to make it your own, you can go, okay, hey, this has what I like here, what I like there, what I like there. It's all in this one podcast. So that's kind of the, the key, I think. And it's also proven that not only can it draw people, but it can be profitable. And right now, when we don't have actual wrestling shows, it's a really, really good time to get people to sit down and to learn stuff that they may not have thought of before or learn about people that they may not have before. There are going to be people that are hearing my sultry voice that go, wow. I am so turned on right now. I need to go to every show that he's on and find out where he's at just to see if, if the face matches the voice. And unfortunately, it doesn't. But the voice is there. So, you know, or, or people might learn something where they're like, hey, what was that match you mentioned? i got to check that out. Or Mambo Italiano, I'm going to Google him and see what comes up or, or you know, whatever the case may be. So it, it, it opens people's world into something that they may never have thought about before. I kind of wish that podcasts were around when I was, that 14 or 15 year old kid because my horizons would have been opened up and I would have seen a world that I would have never thought of before. Uh, agreed. Agreed. We're on the same level, you know, we're seven years apart, but yeah, I completely agree. We're on the same level. If this was back then, uh, I would hope to have a, a mecha center of podcasting. 
Uh, why did you stop yours? Why did you stop yours? You, you ha you've uh, had great people on your show. You, you've amazing content. And then it's just goodbye. Well, it was, it was twofold. One, at the time, I had interviewed certain people, and I had maybe 10 to 15 people that were like, hey, can you interview me? Hey, can you interview me? When I started listening to the quality of my podcast compared to other people, I went, you know what? I don't think it's up to par, and I have one of two options. I can either make it better or I can stop doing it. And it's the same thing I've always looked at wrestling. I don't wrestle because I wouldn't be up to par with everybody else. So if my podcast isn't on the same level as other people, though the quality of the guests I had and the, the interaction and everything was good, uh, sometimes it, it, the audio quality might not have been what I wanted or, ah, you know what, I should have re-recorded that and used this cleaner take, that type of thing. And it's like if I'm not going to be able to do 100% and put my entire heart into it, then I don't want to do it. And I had other uh, things taking up my time. I had other interests. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to sit back and I will – retweet and share and promote other podcasts and you know try and uh, put forward what i see and try and help that stuff and let them do what they do and then i'll kind of sit back and watch and let people that are better at it than me do what they do better so it, it took it took it was a pill to swallow but but i accepted it and i moved on and i'm better for it and i do have probably about an hour's worth of stuff recorded just stories and bs and, and potter story time and stuff like that that has not been uh, seen the light of day. So there may be an episode that comes back some rainy day. And what better time now when uh, there, there's no wrestling? When it's freaking pouring outside. Yeah. Exactly. So that's actually one of the things I'm going to gloat a little bit about us, that we aren't over-publicized. We aren't over-produced, that we get a lot of feedback on it. You know, three drunk guys talking wrestling or myself stumbling trying to get questions to you or whoever else. But that people are like, man, you guys are just so generic and so genuine that that's why we like listening to you though those are a lot you know how you get feedback comments and everything and that's what me makes us continue to ride this out we don't have much we really don't you you've probably seen me record at shows before with the whole system that i bring or whatever it, it just keeps it normal you know people like listening to drunk idiots more or less is what it is yeah i think there's a form of realism to it when i Recorded with uh, uh, Dylan Bostic on one of my episodes. He said, are we going to do this here? And I said, yeah. He said, we'll hear the background. Like, you could hear people in the ring. And you couldn't hear what was going on, but you could hear people bumping and stuff. To me, it was that element of, yeah, this is being done in real time. It's a conversation. It's not, you know, this fabricated thing in a studio where I sent you the questions, you know, a week in advance. And, and you had to think about your answers. It's just kind of off the cuff. Because I think that's. Not only is it real, you get better answers that way, but you also get more in-depth because people don't have time to think of, okay, well, should I say this? Should I not say that? Should should I worry about that? You just get more realism from people. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's let's wrap this up, and we're going to have to schedule another one because there's so much that we haven't touched on. But uh, what events – and I know this is going to sound stupid, but do you have any events booked coming up here in the near future? Uh, well, I do have a court appearance. Oh, no, wait, no, that's a whole other story. Uh, no, it's a, it's a sodomy charge, but my lawyer's going to get it reduced to tailgating. So, um, going f that's another Jim Cornette line. Going forward, yeah, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, nothing at this time. Obviously, the, the pandemic has put a uh, damper on that. But you can always check me at Rise Wrestling, Rise underscore wrestling uh, on the Internet. Um, you can also check me out on TikTok and Instagram, BC underscore steel. For the love of God, there is an E on the end of my name, S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. Uh, one SF Podcast on Twitter, that stands for One Step Forward Podcast. Uh, I am on the Facebook, so you can check me out there. Uh, Premier Championship Wrestling out of Cleveland, Ohio. I do commentary with Joe Dombrowski. Uh, if you go to Joe Dombrowski's YouTube, you can check out previous matches. You can check out a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of information and, uh, and uh, great things that Joe and I have done. Uh, you'll, I'll be back there once shows start up for premiere in Cleveland, doing commentary as only I can. But that's pretty much it, and you never know where I might show up. Uh, when you have money and you have intelligence and you have connections, you can kind of show up wherever you want and uh, wreak havoc as I see fit. And that's just not wrestling shows. I may show up to uh, you know uh, scrapbooking events. I might show up to a... Uh, 
a yarn and crochet festival, a cooking show. I might just show up anywhere and then flip over some tables. Uh, final question, because you at least left one of them out. Uh, and I'm not going to – you talked about adult stuff earlier. I thought you were going to say something like that where you were going. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, if you could manage – the generic question, if you could manage one historical stable in your life uh, – who would you have liked to manage in, you know, Heenan family, DX, you know, come on, we, we can just name them all. Who's your pick? Uh, weirdly enough, the Dangerous Alliance. Yes! For the specific reason you had Rick Rude, potential main eventer. Steve Austin, who wasn't at that level yet, but still, main eventer. You had uh, Bobby Eaton, legend, veteran, who, maybe not the best talker, so that was your role. You had Larry Zbysko, who was very, very charismatic, could cut a promo, but you could be that auxiliary guy. Steve Austin was the young guy who wasn't there yet. You had Medusa that brought in that that element of something different that you could bounce off of. And then you had Paul Heyman, and obviously that would probably be my role. I don't think I would be taking the role of Rick Rude or anybody. (laughs) But, you know, you had that that group of people, and I always point to, I think it was Wrestle War 92 in – in war games, and I think that was the height of what the Dangerous Alliance was. It also helps that I try and take elements from Paul Heyman, sometimes in promos and at ringside and stuff, so that would definitely be a thing, too. Plus, as a manager, Paul Heyman had a lot of face time, which can be dangerous as a manager, but, I mean, he was all over the show at that point, and he was always in top stuff. He was given the time. He was used very, very well. Nice. Uh, I could see you there. And that, that was actually who I, I would have referenced because I don't see you as a Heenan or a Jimmy Hart with a megaphone. Maybe a cornet, but Dangerous is perfect for you. All right, BC. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight on Can Crushers, and have a lovely evening. To you as well. When you have an interview like that, you expect me to wrap this up quick. No, I cannot wrap this up quick. I don't know what you're going to get out of me because of an interview like that. He got done dirty by Hulk Hogan. I just want to say that. He got done dirty by Hulk Hogan. And I was going to bring up my whole Matilda, writing to the Matilda the Bulldog. Uh, You guys have probably heard that story a few times. If you haven't, let me know. And I will bring that back up around again. Uh, It's fun. It really is. But what I like... What he talked about is the same thing that we continue to talk about, Roddy Piper. How he's such a stand-up man. (sighs) B.C. Steele. Guys, we talked after this, and we're coming to terms that B.C. Steele needs to come back on the show. We skimmed over his career. We need to hear about injuries. We need to hear about how Chris LaRusso and him actually got together. We need to hear... Uh, him and Jack Pollock working together, what he really thinks of Calvin. If he does not like Calvin as much as we do, BC will not get a part two. Come on. Calvin is the man. There's just so much to talk to with BC Steel. Yeah, I still did it again. BC Steel. Guys, we love doing these spotlights. You can tell from prior to the interview with everything, I'm still so stoked that we ta- talked with BC Steel, I didn't do it that time. Uh, reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of them are at cancrusher69. Send us an email at cancrusher69 at gmail.com. Tell us, hey, you guys suck. BC Steel was better. Whatever you want to tell us, that's great because that's what we like. And remember, just because you're trash doesn't mean you can't do great things. It's called the garbage can. Not a garbage cannot. B. C. Steel.